Hi everyone, I think two of you are here. I was wondering if anyone is going to... Hi everyone, I was wondering if anyone was going to join today. Can you all hear me? Okay, alright, that's good. Okay, I think we're going to wait for a couple of more minutes because... Yeah, not many people are in today. So how is everyone finding the course so far? Now the last few weeks to it are remaining. All right, that's nice. So can you tell me what backgrounds you all are from? Like, are you ecology students? Or uh, from different... Uh, fields and you're interested in ecology so you've taken this course okay so you are into conservation okay that's nice to know right that explains your active participation as well that's nice Okay, I think I'm going to wait for another minute, but yeah, we can, we can just start. Okay, so any, any, anyway, today is again going to be another discussion session. So yeah, I was hoping for more people, otherwise it's, uh, yeah, it's more fun when there are more people to discuss, but anyway, let's just start. Uh, so, um, so this is a very broad question. So you can use a chat box, so feel free to speak. Uh, what are the factors that contribute to the extinction of a species? It can be anything, it's an open question. Yes, surely, natural disasters. What are the other factors that are responsible for extinction? Uh, Bharat Kumar and Jyotsna, uh, you guys need to tell me some answers as well. This is a very general question, right? What leads to extinction of species? Yeah, hunting, sure. Yes, hunting and poaching, same, almost, yeah, the same category. What else are the factors that can lead to species extinction? You're on the right track. What are the other factors? Like we've we've had so many classes till now. Nobody else knows what can lead to extinction of species. Okay, let's. Uh, yeah. Alien invasion. Uh, sorry, alien invasion. What? Okay, yes, invasive species, sure. Uh, yes, invasive species can lead to uh, the extinction of native species. What are the other factors? Something as, sim something as simple as uh, loss of resources, loss of habitat, habitat fragmentation, lot of anthropogenic factors, right? There are like tons of factors that can lead to extinction of a species. And that is why it is so important for us to know 
like what are the requirements that a species needs to survive yes disease excellent yeah disease also you need to know uh, the life history traits of a species and the factors that are essential for a species to survive in a particular habitat and by knowing this you are able to uh, contribute towards the conservation of these species right all right so uh, i'm going to move to the next slide i don't i'm not sure okay so this is the uh, these are the a few factors that this is an anagram that has been used to help you remember what are the factors that can affect species extinction right so you have does anyone know what this stands for yeah habitat loss i in is the species yes p first p or the second p population explosion overpopulation especially of humans pollution yes and the last one over exploitation yes uh, correct so over exploitation over harvesting just a uh, non sustainable use of resources right so this is just a broad overview but you can always elaborate on any of these factors when uh, you need to answer a uh, a question a very broad question like what are the factors that contribute to extinction right okay uh so i'm going to move to the next slide uh so how sensitive are animals to human activities so now we know that uh there are a lot of anthropogenic factors that affect the distribution of animals right like we have we have read about this in several different case studies but there are certain so species differentially respond to human activities and those can be categorized into three types right so let's the easiest example to take for uh, a human anthropogenic activities is uh, urbanization right all of you agree that urbanization is a factor that can affect species distribution yes ma'am right all right so you have species that they can respond in three broad ways okay you have something called urban avoiders then you have something called urban adapters and then you have another uh, grade of animals or species that fall into this category called urban exploiters um would anyone like to explain or take a guess as to what these three categories could be just based on whatever is written like just as the word itself says urban avoider urban adapter urban exploiter you can you can take a guess also avoiders avoid urban settlements okay sure what about uh, adapters adapters adapt with humans okay sure and what about exploiters what do you think are urban exploiter animals close relationship with humans yes that is correct and what is this uh, close relationship yes they make use of the resources of urban areas yes that is very correct could you think of the resources that uh, any of these bird uh, any of any of these animals would use like think of your uh, wherever you stay or if you are staying in a little less urban area imagine like a big city what is the most like a big uh, uh, city with a very high population of humans and infrastructure what are the species that you yes find there yes example feeding on waste 
so they have a lot of food resources right because humans generate a lot of waste right what do you think are examples of urban exploiters they they <laughs> crows yeah sure i mean yeah make crows could be and an example yeah what is the, what is the other more than crows what is the other abundant animal yes <laughs> the pigeon right all of you have seen feral pigeons everywhere and you have kabutar khanas in a lot of different cities all over uh, india and people go and put huge amounts of grain so all these grain are just ensuring that these uh, that the population of these feral pigeons increases in the cities right and they have a lot of health hazards i don't know if you are all aware that um, our house pigeons they are uh, feral pigeons they their fecal matter is very dangerous and it causes a lot of respiratory diseases so uh, having them in close close proximity to human homes and human shared spaces is uh, not very healthy right so uh, other examples are like cockroaches like you know they are completely dependent on human resources rats you have a lot of rats everywhere in the city right so you get like the general idea of how certain animals respond like you will not see um for example what can i tell you you won't see like a lion or a tiger or something inside a city right or let's say a sloth bear for example in a city right they are never found near cities because they are not they are they can't take to any urban development right so out here if you look at the panel out here you see urbanization level i don't know if, oh yeah you can see my mouse let me get that right here okay so you have urbanization level here and you have avoiders that completely fall down when urbanization increases adapters have a peak and then they drop as urbanization levels completely increase a lot and exploiters are totally dependent on urbanization right they are dependent on humans for their survival so uh, in this study done out here uh, of three different species they used a metric for urbanization as night time lights right so the amount of light so you have uh, maps in which you can find out uh, you can measure urbanization based on the lights that are uh, emitted by any infrastructural uh, bodies or anything like that so uh, so if you see like large cities there is a lot of night light right throughout the day there is in fact light uh, people are using like it's because it's the, the cities are active throughout the day so as a measure of urbanization they have used a metric of night light and they have taken the example of three species in these three categories so you have a wonga pigeon this is not our feral house pigeon this is a pigeon that is found only in the forest like for example in india you have the nilgiri wood pigeon right these nilgiri wood pigeons are uh, one of the largest pigeons and they are of, they are found only in forested areas they are not found inside the city like our feral pigeons so if you see they are as the urbanization nighttime light increases they are steadily decreasing so this falls a pattern of an urban avoider then you have this uh, species called the eastern spinebill right they have two peaks one is when uh, the urbanization level is less and one when it is more but it there is like a stasis out here and there is a sheer drop out here right at the end when night time lights increase or there is high urbanization whereas uh, the rainbow lorikeet that you see out here it is very low in uh, rural settings but as you go towards urban settings their population completely increases following the pattern of an urban exploiter right so this is a very interesting and a very current topic in science to look into
and uh, if any of you are interested in doing projects like this is one of like a really good place to start with this is data that is collected from citizen science data which is basically like people have not gone out and done surveys like the scientists themselves but it is a culmination of a lot of resources that have been pooled in by uh, everybody like the common man like citizen science every, all the citizens they are making observations a checklist of birds that they are finding in their areas and these resources are pooled onto certain portals known as ebird or i naturalist and the scientists have taken uh, after filtering data from these portals have taken them and found these patterns that there are certain patterns of species that avoid urban Uh, setups while there are certain species that totally thrive in these urban areas right so um, these are how animals can adapt to human activities and how sensitive they are so some are sensitive some are not sensitive and the ones that are sensitive are the ones that need conservation a higher conservation priority all right uh, so this was just a bit of extra information also to remember okay So according to the theory of island biogeography that all of you must be knowing species richness is dependent on what the area of an island the species type occupying the island both a and b or none of the above so you have so we extensively covered this last week you have the mainland here and then you have two islands here so what really does uh drive species richness Okay, one answer for C. Okay, another answer for C. Anybody else? Who else do we have here? Jyotsna, Sneha, Amol. Okay, see. Uh, so, tell me why? 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 Why is it? Why are both these factors important? Would someone like to explain? Why not only the area of an island? Okay, tell me, uh, what kind of okay bigger areas can accommodate more species? Sure, yes, correct. Uh, so why not just the area? Why does it need to have the species type occupying the island? Sure, like for example. Mammals can swim, right? Quite a few mammals can swim. A lot of large mammals can swim. <laughs> Some mammals, okay, sure. And uh, they can't swim like large distances, right? They might be able to go to small distances, but not to large distances. But if you take, for example, birds, birds can fly large distances. Even if the islands are far away, they can reach those islands, right? So the species type definitely does matter. Okay. So, so has anyone heard of this debate called the Sloss debate? S L O S S. It is basically known for Uh, an approach for planning conservation strategies in fragmented landscape right so s l o s s actually stands for single large or several small has anyone heard of this if no one's heard of it then we can just like discuss okay banal you heard of it would you like to like explain little bit like maybe Single large is better. Okay, sure. What about the others? Do you have any views on this? So you have a fragmented habitat 
fragmented habitat you all know right what it means it's a habitat that is uh, split into multiple different small small portions because of some anthropogenic activity like for example if you have like roads criss crossing through a national park you will have multiple fragmented patches right okay fragmented small is dangerous for animals okay uh, so there is this theory that uh, there was a team of scientists that uh, had this a school of thought rather at a certain point of time as to whether conservation should be planned in a single large space or multiple small spaces should be protected right and there are a lot of factors that are for certain uh, approaches and not for the other approach right so i'm going to just pull up a table that shows us the differences between the two and why one of them is more important so you, the first thing is the size itself right so you have here a reserve size if you look at this so a single large reserve is better than small ones why is this so we are not talking about numbers here we are just talking about the size why is a large reserve better than a small reserve any ideas no ideas okay panel said single large is better okay they can have more interaction yes sure they also have a lot of uh, resources available in their habitat right so uh, the next point is how many should we have should we have one large or multiple small so the school of thought says one large reserve is better than a few small ones of the same area right because uh, again if you see that the area in this would be like all the species can interact with each other and in this case it's getting fragmented right then the other theory is should they should these patches be close together or should they be far away from each other right so uh, when you are uh, considering proximity of these if you have lot of small ones should they be close or far it is said that they should be close so that there is some amount of connectivity that they can have if you put corridors right but if they are too far from each other they have they remain absolutely disconnected right then and then the other factor comes should you have corridors or no corridors right so you have corridors that are connected that uh, i don't know if uh, you might have read uh, if some papers or in the news they have several corridors that are created for these animals to cross between uh regions in forest like suppose there is a huge highway or a commercial road that is going through a forested space yes you have elephant corridors and uh, even if for smaller animals you have the they have these uh, kind of uh, swings or these pathways that are put above the roads so that these monkeys and squirrels and all these uh, arboreal creatures can cross instead of going Uh, down the road and getting uh, killed by vehicular becoming road kids right so connected ones yes himachal pradesh yes definitely sure yeah a lot of places do have this and a lot of places are trying to uh, make provision for uh, keeping corridors all right uh, so if we say reserve shape uh whether the shape should be like circular or uh, uh this is a bit oblong so you have compact shapes are best for minimizing boundary length right so the area would be lesser if it is so this is kind of like just a squish circle but if you can imagine like a squiggly squiggly line with a center it has a lot of boundary area and it becomes difficult to manage so a single circular area has a better boundary to be able to protect properly right 
So then the other one was to have buffers or not buffer zone. Now, does anyone know what is a buffer zone and why it is important? Does anyone know what a buffer zone is? Buffer zone has human involvement, it's outside the core area, sure. Yeah. So you have a core area where uh, no humans are allowed inside. And then you have, uh, like if you see national parks, you will see that there is another uh, zone that is marked around the core zone, as Rhino has explained. Uh, it is known as a buffer zone where you have um, human, yes, as Bharat says, limited human activity, right? There is no absolute human activity, but they are allowed to go into that area at certain points of time in the day. And the animals are also like found in that area. And then after that, you have the area that is occupied by the humans, right? So there is no stark difference between the human occupied space and the core protected space. You have a buffer zone, which is kind of an intermediate between both the zones. And these are really important because this provide this prevents either party from entering into the other side and having conflict, right? All right. Uh, so, uh, so this is the theory of the SLOSS debate, which is to either to have a single, large, or several small reserve. And by this discussion, you can clearly see that uh, it is a single, large reserve that is important, right? Rather than uh, several small reserves, which is not at all preferable. Okay. Uh, so. Um, so according to uh, like what we have just discussed on whether to have a single large or several small reserves, uh, according to the theory of even like island biogeography, uh, which of the following species would have the highest rate of extinction? Species A, which has a population size of 200 and is found on four islands. Species B, with a population size of 100 and found on one island. Species C, which has a population size of 100 and found on four islands, or species D, with a population size of 60 and found on one island. Which do you think would have the highest rate of extinction? B. And you can D. Okay. So Amon says D, Ranu says D. Uh, and also, I would just like to clarify that these, when they are split into multiple islands, they are equally split. Okay. D, D, T. Okay. So everyone seems to have a consensus of D. Okay. Okay. Active participation coming in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so can you tell me why D and not C? So this is a total population, or why not uh, A? So this is the total population size, right? 200, 100, 160. It's the total population size. It's not the population size on one island. <laughs> okay, if one island is extinct, the other remains, sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but um, let's say that uh, there are no uh, natural disasters or any disease outbreak that can affect this. What do you think? If there is no disease or if there is no natural disasters or there are no such extrinsic factors that might affect, what do you feel? Which of the following species would have? Still D, okay. Tell me why not C.
So if I have species C, I have uh, 24 individuals on every island, right? Yeah, 25 species on one island. Is that better than having 60 species on one island? Sure, the other islands are also having, so I have four islands, all the four islands have 25 individuals. Yeah, but what do you think will happen if the population size is, so we're here we're talking about population size, right? Yeah, inbreeding is not happening, okay, I'm going to change this answer to B, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so let's, let's break this down a little more. So C actually has 25 individuals on every island, right? B has 100 on one island, C, uh, D has 60 on one island, and uh, A has 50 on each of the four islands, right? So now in terms of population size, the one that has the least in the most number of places has a highest rate of extinction why do you need a large population size, right? Have you have you come across uh, this term called uh, uh, like uh, okay? So let's say uh, so having very few individuals on a particular island lowers the what of the species. Let's go back to some time before where we were discussing uh, growth curves. Yeah, sure. Let's say, okay, let's say we are talking about uh, wolves. Okay. And uh, I have, uh, let's just take example C and example D. I have 20 wolves or 25 wolves on each of these four islands that are not at all connected whereas I have another island with 60 wolves on one island. Which of these wolf species would have a higher rate of extinction? And why do you think so? <laughs> 60 species on one? Okay, but I would think it would be the other one, which is 25 species on... See, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, I would feel it is one because... Yeah, so, okay, Randall, that is that is fine. So, I'm saying there are no natural disasters or no disease, no pandemics or anything, right? But you have a crucial population size that is important, right? And more the number of individuals, more the amount of genetic diversity, Right? So, uh, 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 an island with a very few number of individuals has a, has a very low genetic diversity, right? And what if those all those 20 animals are related to each other? They will then, re, that will then result in inbreeding, right? And inbreeding will lead to something known as inbreeding depression, which means that... Uh, so, I'm sure uh, I'm, I, we have covered this in the earlier classes, but uh, it basically tells you that the genetic viability of the population becomes very low, right, because of inbreeding de depression and it leads to a lot of congenital diseases amongst individuals. So, you need a certain number of individuals to maintain a healthy population. Yes, I totally agree with you on... Uh, catastrophes and disease if they are only found on one island rather than other islands uh, the one that is found on one island that's affected will end up wiping out but considering that there are no such external factors just purely based on population size uh, 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 a few number of individuals completely spread out in multiple different places are more likely to get extinct than 
a single large population found in a single place right does this does this make sense does anyone have any doubts okay then we'll just move on to the next question uh, okay so which of these following areas does not support in situ conservation um national park a zoological oops a zoological park an arboretum or a reserve forest is it option 1 uh, and 2 option 1 and 3 option 2 and 4 option 2 and 3 Yeah, sure, Ranul. We can we can discuss this. okay option d that is 2 and 3 do not support uh in situ conservation okay everyone's like d okay 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 cool i think uh, everyone is clear on the idea of what is in situ and ex situ conservation which is great um so we can move on to the next question so can you tell me what are the advantages of ex situ type of conservation you can just throw some points so tell me what are the types of ex situ conservation genetic diversity is maintained okay so what happens in ex situ conservation are they inside are they in the natural habitat or outside the natural habitat outside yes captive breeding okay and what are the advantages when when is ex situ type of conservation preferred over in situ type of conservation when the animal number is critically in danger mm -hmm. yes correct that is right sure they can be uh, saved from extinction uh, when there is very less chances of survival in the uh, natural habitat sure yeah i think yeah everyone has given the right answers okay so i'm just going to move on uh yes when there is high predation rate sure when there are very few in number and the level of predation is high also you can take it as uh, hunting pressures uh anthropogenic uh, factors like hunting pressures when they are very high for certain species that's how several species have gotten extinct right because of like for example the dodo the bird that uh, is was found in i think it was madagascar they are extinct because they were excessively mauritius yes correct thanks for correcting me uh, they are extinct now because they were excessively hunted and these birds were so not used to humans or they had inhabited to humans that uh, they had no form of defenses right so all of them were just killed and yep they got wiped out so yeah that's when you have ex situ type of conservation that forms an important role in uh making sure that a particular species are, is still uh, the gene pool is at least still maintained all right uh so tell me in which approach do we protect and conserve the animals that need 
urgent measures to save it from extinction. I think we just discussed it. So you should know. Yeah, it is uh, C. Anybody else feels it is not C? Okay, yeah, it is C. Okay. Uh, okay. So now if you want to have the long term preservation of a particular species, especially like a uh, critically endangered species, uh, what would this uh, conservation strategy involve? Would it involve botanical gardens? Would it involve cryopreservation techniques? Would it involve zoological parks? Or would it involve wildlife safari parks? What do you think is a long-term preservation strategy? B, okay. B, B, B. Okay. Can someone describe what is cry preservation? Deep freezing. Deep freezing. Yes. Deep freezing in? What is the substance that it is frozen in? Preserved in rather. Yes. Liquid nitrogen, right? So, liquid nitrogen uh, allows these uh, samples to be preserved at uh, very, very low temperatures and they can be revived if they are stored at this temperature. So, if you've seen a lot of, even if you are talking about like preservation just in general, you will see that uh, bodies of animals that have gotten extinct in uh, towards the poles like in the ice are very well preserved in nature because cold conditions preserve uh, structures or like uh, not not just any structure but like perishable structures very well so the complete form is preserved and similarly like liquid nitrogen you're completely just arresting any uh, activity that can happen inside these cells and they can be stored for years and years to come and then they can be taken out like for example uh, I don't know if you might have heard there's this uh, I think it's the northern white rhino species that is totally extinct in the wild and there is just uh, I think two females that are alive right now in the world and they are in a a protected park in Africa and uh, I don't know if it's the northern white rhino or the southern white rhino and so what they have done is uh, to revive or to try and bring back the species there are no males uh, uh, alive right so you cannot have and these two females are mother and daughter so what they have done is that via uh, cryopreservation techniques they had preserved the sperm of uh, older white rhinos from other zoos that don't exist right now but they were present several years ago and the eggs of these uh, current white rhinos that are alive and via in vitro fertilization techniques they have created viable zygotes by using these cryopreserved sperm and these eggs from these uh, females of these white rhinos and uh, perhaps now they might uh, um, put those zygotes or these fertilized eggs inside a co-occurring, uh, a, a similarly related species and see whether that might be successful in, you know, bringing back these, I think it was northern white rhinos into the 
population back again. It of course it will take a lot of time because rhinos don't have a very fast gestation period like rats or I don't know some other smaller species. But uh, yes, this is where cry preservation techniques do come into play. And even uh, like uh, for plants, a lot of germplasm, you have a lot of things, uh, these things known as uh, seed banks and seeds from various different varieties of uh, species are stored and cryopreserved in these uh, control conditions so that if we have a certain and especially like food crops, so a lot of uh, seeds of food crops are cryopreserved so that we don't lose out on diversity in genetic diversity in any of these, right? All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so I wanted to have like a, di a discussion on this, but uh, all of you have been following the news, right? About this. Has anyone not heard about Cheetahs coming back to India. Can anyone tell me anything about these cheetahs that are coming to India? Or the cheetahs that were in India before? Anyone? Anything? No one's reading the news? Yes, correct. They've come from Namibia these current cheetahs and what cheetahs are these? Are these the cheetahs that were found in India? No, okay, they are the African cheetah, okay. Also, what were the cheetahs that were found in India? Which cheetahs were found in India? Was it the African cheetah? Asiatic cheetah, yes. Okay, so that's right. And where are Asiatic cheetahs extinct? Okay, Bharat says yes. Anyone else? Do you know if Asiatic cheetahs are extinct or not? extinct in the wild but where are they mm. okay so what does that mean where else are they found with zoos where are these zoos <laughs> yes the Asiatic cheetah is found in Iran right and that this was the natural distribution of the Asiatic cheetah. So there are two subspecies of the cheetah. The one that is known as the African cheetah and the one that is known as the Indian cheetah, right? So Indian cheetahs got extinct in India about 75 years ago due to hunting pressure. And the Asiatic cheetah, which is Echinonyx jubatus veneticus, is now only found in Iran and there are very few individuals, right? There are just less than 50 individuals. And the African cheetah is known as the Asinonyx or Achinonyx jubatus jubatus. And this, what is happening in India, is the first intercontinental global translocation of any species. Uh, and in this case, like we had eight cheetahs that were at present translocated to India and do you know where these cheetahs are being uh, have been released in India? Kuno, yes this is Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh where these uh, cheetahs have been uh, released. Uh, so what do you think is happening out here in terms of like uh, conservation? Has this helped in the conservation of the Indian cheetah? or what is actually happening. Any ideas? I have a map of the distribution of the cheetah. 
so here you can see uh, all the area in red is where the cheetah has become extinct the hashed out red is where it's possibly extinct uh, these maroonish pinkish areas are where they might be there or might be might be resident or might be passing through and the yellow orange areas the dark orange areas are the ones where they are staying and the light orange ones are where they walk through or they pass through so if you see these dark orange patches are very few right and if you see namibia this is namibia out here the our cheetahs that have come to india have come from namibia they are the uh, ish they are African cheetahs, not the Asiatic cheetahs. So there is a huge debate as to uh, what is happening and as to why it is happening. But I guess only time will tell um, whether uh, this particular species will be able to survive in our habitat after yeah, being used to the African kind of terrain. But uh, yeah, something interesting that's happening in our country and uh, I'm sure further news will tell us what else, how, what is the status of these animals. So as far as I last read, I think uh, they have been put, they are under a 30 day quarantine to see how they acclimatize to the Indian habitat and then after that uh, they might be... Uh, yeah free to roam or i'm not really sure but yeah so another example of how uh, different species can be completely translocated from one uh, continent to another continent and since this has not been done before we'll see whether uh, yeah they are able to um, survive on their own given the prey the indian prey but yeah the species is not used to the indian prey but we'll see how that pans out to be okay so actually uh, everything is done for today's class and i had i wanted to bring up two other things i think uh, joven has brought this up as well earlier uh, so this is the gate ecology uh, and evolution exam that is organized by uh, IIT Kanpur this year. So the last date, if you all are interested in ecology and evolution, uh, please uh, don't forget to register for uh, this exam. The last registration date is the 30th of September and the syllabus is linked here. And if you actually go and see the syllabus, it is very similar to what we have covered in this course, right? The exam is in February, so uh, it's a multiple choice uh, paper. I think it does have negative marking, but uh, you can always use the previous year's papers and solve them. And uh, this uh, entrance exam helps you in getting, oh yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so it helps you in getting a JRF position, which is like a junior research fellowship position in uh, various institutes all over India that have projects related to ecology and evolutionary biology. So if you clear this exam with a good rank, uh, you can get into JRF positions or even a PhD program if your uh, institute accepts gate ecology. Uh, no, actually it is not probably useful for microbiology. I'm not sure if there is a gate microbiology itself, but there is a gate life science. I'm not sure if there's microbiology, but you have net microbiology or UGC net microbiology as a choice. But uh, no, this exam won't be useful for any particular microbiology related position. But uh, it's very useful if you want to get into any ecology position and uh, into any of these top institutes in the country. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are, uh, like even people who are in the field of ecology, they have questions as to what next, what can you do after you study ecology or uh, 
pick up ecology in the future and somebody wrote a really cool paper on what are the career options in ecology uh, so this is a paper in ecology and evolution this um, particular journal and uh, it is an ecologist career compass a game to explore different career paths so i've linked it out here and it has various career types right so you have it's divided into four broad sectors academia the government private or non profit and you can have eight types of positions right you can be a technician you can be a science communicator an editor or publisher a manager an educator a coordinator a policy maker or a data scientist right these are all the qualities that people in the field of ecology and evolution tend to gain by their the work or the places that they work in and um, so here you have the position so this is like a game which has a bunch of trump cards and you have particular skills that have certain ratings so here you have a researcher uh and uh, the required skills are four stars for creativity four stars for quantitative skills uh five stars for field and lab techniques so for admin you need only two stars for communicating you need four stars for teaching and mentoring you need three stars interpersonal skills you need five stars right so you have like is this is like a yeah i can just so if you can see this this is the paper and it has like a description of all the different positions it's just like a fun way for people to know uh, what they would like to choose if uh, as a career option if they choose ecology right and uh, it's been used it can be used in various different ways i can just show you what the file looks like so uh, you have these really colorful cards that you can print them and stick them and uh, they are divided into various different sectors so you can play this just like you play with trump cards so i just this paper recently just got released so i thought i would share it with everyone uh, so if you're interested please uh, feel free to yeah check it out but uh, yeah all right so i am going to leave it on this cake page Thanks for all coming today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll wait for a minute. If not, we shall meet next week. Uh, why three males and five females? I think they always like the female uh, numbers to be higher because uh, that will ensure that. uh the population is reproductively uh, active so if you have uh, more males than females you are less likely to have more progeny right because all the burden will be on that one female and it won't form a viable population so you always have the female to male ratio higher yeah all right all right then uh if no more questions uh, we shall meet next week for week 9 okay i'm going to stop the recording see you guys next week